Hill, and the call to worship. So we've looked at, you know, the uh, misinterpretation of worship, what worship is, amen. And so tonight we start uh, a new topic, which is uh, the sacrifice of worship. And so I'm going to be asking you tonight to maybe share uh, where you feel like you've seen sacrificial worship uh, you can share, you know, your own personal story or what you gleaned from someone else. What do you think about that? Other than what you shared with me last night, maybe you can just paraphrase what we did there a little bit later. We were talking about Paul and Silas, so that was a really good thing you had to say. Um, so we're just going to be looking tonight just really at uh, the sacrifice of worship. I would say this is probably for... Uh, for, for me, uh, I would think even for most people, my experience, that uh, the, the sacrifice, the sacrificial worship, is probably the toughest part of worship. Uh, because it does require something. And it requires something that is given from us, that word sacrifice alone. We think about that when you sacrifice something, it means that you, know, you, uh, you, you, you give... Uh, something you cut back that you may give in another area. You know, sometimes, you know, there may be one bill that comes, but you sacrifice in another area to pay that bill. Or, you know, I uh, someone has said to me before, you know, uh, uh, when, when a mom sacrifices to stay home, you know, you sacrifice that, that, uh, uh, that revenue coming in because you uh, feel that the investment in raising children uh, is greater than that revenue of, of fiscal things coming in. So it's a sacrifice. Uh, it certainly is uh, uh, in, in some ways. And uh, you, you may know what it's like to sacrifice to send your kids to school. Uh, you know, if you send them to college, the sacrifice that's given. Uh, there's a sacrifice in a lot of things in life. But God really wants our worship to be a sacrifice. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. Uh, do I do I think that uh, always, for the Craig, you were talking about that that rhythm, the cycle, and the seasons of life, where you say you kind of you know there's not a, a great uh, uh, deluge of uh, the the presence of God or things being escalated. Thank God they're not being uh, uh, tough things coming. I guess that's the positive side. But but you know sometimes when we're in those cycles, sometimes when the tough things come, that's when sacrificial worship begins. And uh, and so we want to look at that tonight. How, how do we how do we get ourselves to a place where we're ready to give sacrificial worship? Well, I believe it becomes our lifestyle uh, as a believer that worship is a part of who we are. That even when it comes to those difficult times, that we can give sacrificial worship to God because it becomes ingrained in us who we are that we can worship. Everybody has their story, and uh, your story's encouraging. Everybody probably knows someone in the faith that's encouraged them by their sacrifice. And so I do want to hear that a little later this evening. Someone read uh, Hebrews 13, verse 15 through 16. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. So by him, or by Jesus Christ, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. How often should we be sacrificing praise to God? Continually. That's always. Always in our life. So every day of our life, every season of our life, uh, uh, with, with everything that happens, we need to continually be worshiping God. And the Bible says that it is the fruit or it is the produce of our lips as we, as we worship God. And uh, Brother Greg, go ahead and read verse number 16. But to do good and to communicate forget not, for with such sacrifices God is more pleased. So our communication, how many of you know communication is important in life? You know that in marriage, communication is the key thing. You know, if you don't talk to one another, you're going to have problems. 
You know, if you don't communicate what your expectations are, what your feelings are, if you don't communicate uh, your life with someone, your marriage is going to fail. I'll just tell you that bottom line. Communication is important for parents and children. It communicates what is the expectation. Uh, it communicates the love of God, the nurture of God. Everything that we do, uh, our jobs, we have to communicate. Uh, if you're not going to be a team player, uh, you probably aren't going to do well at your job, but you need to communicate. And so communication is important. How many of you enjoy when someone engages you in communication? There are some people that never learn communication. They think that it's always about them talking and everyone else listening without ever being an active listener. And then there's some who, um, you know, they, they, they don't communicate well. They don't share their feelings. They don't share uh, 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 a wanting to collaborate. And so it, it gives a breach of relationship. So if we as believers... Uh, the sacrifice of worship depends not on how we feel, uh, but, but really uh, it is about us communicating with God sacrifices of our praise. The Bible says that those sacrifices of our praise, uh, it, it's well-pleasing to God. Uh, I believe it's Mandisa. She has a song out that's called A Broken Hallelujah. You know, hallelujah is the same in every language, right? But when we can worship God, even on our brokenness, even when we don't feel well or we're not experiencing things going well, if we can still worship God. And that's the theme of what she's saying. Learn to praise God continually, even in the brokenness, even when things aren't going right. And it's easy to be frustrated. It's easy to be angry at God or frustrated at God because we live faithful. When we, when we are believers and we're in the Word of God, when we're praying, when we're striving, does it mean everything's always right? No, we, we may have our struggles and our ups and downs, but when we're truly striving and we're pressing toward the prize and things don't go right, sometimes it's easy to be somewhat uh, upset with God. And so then it, it comes in and it robs the praise. But God really wants our praise even when things aren't going well because it shows that we trust Him even when we don't uh, quite agree with what's happening or we don't understand or we don't like it. And so uh, the sacrifice of worship does not depend upon how we feel. We may feel defeated. We may feel defeated. We must worship anyway. We may feel sick. We may feel sick. But we must praise anyway. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, you know well about that. You recently were very, very sick. And, uh, but you communicated worship and praise and trust in God. That's what God wants, brother. And that's been cultivated in your life. And so, I'm, I'm sorry? The only thing I know. Amen. That's only, the only thing you need to know, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. And there's, there's beauty in that for us as believers to behold. When, when Jacob, uh, Jacob worshipped when he was dying, when he was dying, someone read that, that Hall of Faith chapter, uh, Hebrews 11, verse number 21. Here he is. Jacob knew he was dying. He blessed Joseph's sons. And he worshipped. Jacob had not lived an easy life. He had not lived an easy life. He faced storms. He faced personal pain and grief. Think about the life of Jacob. His life is not one that, that we know the supplanter, but he becomes a, a, a prince with God. We think about him. Uh, uh, in addition to his father, lost slash oak, uncle oak Laban, uh, betraying him, betraying him. Some of his sons had betrayed him. He had been through a lot physically emotionally, mentally, 
financially and spiritually. Yet in his dying moments, he as he reflected over his life, he didn't complain. Worship. Remember a couple Sundays ago I preached on He makes everything beautiful in His time and the cycles and the seasons of life and trusting God in that. And here's Jacob. I'm not saying he did not cause a lot of his own heartache because he did. He made a lot of bad choices. Uh, we, we find him in his life. And so he, he, he reflects over his life. And that's what people do as they're dying. Uh, you've been around anybody who's dying or, you know, even folks as they enter the very late stages of life, uh, as, as you study uh, just the, the cycles of, of life, you know that they come to that season of life where they're reflecting. And when he reflects over life, he doesn't complain about it. He doesn't murmur. He's not in despair. But he makes a choice to worship. You know, let me just say this. So, you know, that's what I really like about going about seeing your mom. She never complains. She never complains. And, uh, uh, you know, I look at her life. She lost a son very young. And uh, she, she lost another child. She's lost a grandson. She's lost a spouse. Um, but, you know, she's just so adamant of how good God has been to her. And uh, I won't share some of our moments, but we, we, we had a really deep conversation a few weeks ago. And uh, she just mesmerized me. I love when people enter into a place of worship. It's so important. And she reassures me over and over again that she is just trusting God and all is well with God. How beautiful is that? And that is a life of worship. And here is Jacob. Yes, he found out that the, the wife that he did not want to marry really in, 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 in the long run turned out to love him and bless him and be a, a, a great blessing to him even though it wasn't what he expected. How many of us in our life, you know, we're married to things. I'm not talking about our spouse. I'm just talking about situations we look to and we think, man, this is a bad thing. This is terrible. I don't like this, yada, yada, yada. But when, in the end, we can reflect and we can worship because God actually has utilized that and that has really become the greatest uh, curse in our life, but it really became the greatest blessing. Amen. Think about this. When you are in a place where you are physically. Now, most of us in here don't know a lot of physical pain. Some of us may. Amen. But, but he has been through physical pain. Can you imagine being through the mental pain? He's been through a lot of things. I mean, hiding away, knowing the decisions that he's made he hasn't always been good. Uh, it's had an effect upon even his children. Uh, so mentally, what's going through his mind? And you look at uh, financially, spiritually, all these things can take a toll on people because you look at those economic, social statuses, it affects people. You look at the things that they go through and it affects them up mentally and physically, but most of all spiritually. Amen. So uh, the goal is that, that we bring all those things and we process it, but we fall so in love with God and we have the confidence in God that we worship Him instead of complaining. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So uh, let's shift gears. And I could talk so much about Jacob, uh, but, but, but I'm going to move on. In, in the first chapter of Job, we read about Job's dilemma. He had received four, four, F-O-U-R, devastating messages. Number one, his cattle and his servants were uh, 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 with him uh, were killed. So all of his cattle, he has his cattle, brother uh, Eli, that are huge, and he has servants that he is able to pay to take care of them. They're all killed. Uh, I'll get... I'll make an addendum here in a minute. Just go with me for a moment. His sheep and the servants with them were uh, burnt up. Number two. His sheep and the servants with, uh, with them were burnt up. Number three. His camel and the servants with them had been slain. Now, you know, really, that is all very devastating. You imagine taking a huge financial loss. Really, you know, 
uh, that is where, you know, there is security in those things financially. And he has worked hard to get there. We don't know the whole story, Brother Doug, before he got there. But he's been faithful and he's worked, Brother Craig. And these are the things that he's worked for. And as he's worked for them, you know, uh, all of us can think about things that we put investments in. Uh, we put investments in our home. Uh, we put investments in retirement. We put investments in things that, that, you know, as we build our life and we get equity in it, it's, there's, there's a little bit of security. Not that we're looking for security in this life, but, but we make wise choices that mentally help us and they physically help us. And it, if, whether you want to agree with it or not, but spiritually it helps us because we look and we're satisfied and it helps us on all the levels of our life. And so here it is that he's lost these things that, that are really his economic security and his economic status. But the real kicker comes in number four that all ten of his children are dead. So, as you know, it was said tonight in two prayer requests, Sister Beth said about a 13-year-old, you know, I don't even want to imagine. I don't even want to go there and imagine. I, I, can't, I can't place myself. All I can do would be to comfort a parent. I cannot even imagine or pretend that I know what that parent's going through because I don't. And I hope I never know that. And Sister Tina, you said of yours, the cousin I lost a 30-year-old, I don't care. I don't care if they're growing away from home. I, I, I can't imagine that. That is, all of us, I think, can relate. I'm not going to give any more details on that. But here's Joe. That's all he has. And all the time I'm home. I can't even imagine the waves of sorrow. I can't even imagine the piercing of spirit and soul. I can't even imagine how he must feel physically. Mental. Mental. How would that make any of us feel if the same thing happened to us? You know, brother, I don't know and I don't want to know. I don't I don't even want on that. You know, I, I don't even imagine things like that because that's craziness. I'll be a little transparent. Just in the own losing of my sibling, just threw my world for a loop. So I, I can't even imagine ten children. You know, it's just it's it's unimaginable. I, I I don't know how to paint a picture. <laughs> you you understand? There was only one. There was only one survivor from each of these calamities, and it wasn't one of his children. Now listen to Job's reaction. Then Job arose and rent his mantle. Shaved his head. And fell upon the ground and worshipped. Agree with me or disagree with me, but I'll believe strongly on this. But he just endured enough that he kill a man. But his response was that he worshipped. And in verse 21, I'm going to read it from the Word of God. Part of it's missing in our notes. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord took it. But, bless. Go back a little bit. We understand 
that roaming to and fro throughout the earth was Satan himself. And he came and he saw Job. And he saw the blessings that God had bestowed upon him. He saw Job's life. He saw his righteousness. He saw him when no one else was looking because Job didn't know that the enemy was watching him. And he saw his integrity. He saw his character. He saw his devotion, his love for God, and he saw his worship. And when Satan come before God, he said, you know, what's going to happen? Job's going to curse you. You remove all these things from him, and Job will curse you. And so uh, here it is that Satan, as he said, that Job would curse God in his face if such calamity fell upon him. But here it is that the Lord proved that it wasn't, uh, uh, that wasn't in what Job had, but it was in the relationship that he had with God. It wasn't in what he had physically. It wasn't what God had blessed him with. But it was in a relationship with God. And so here it is that Job says, But blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, In all this Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. Yes, there are questions why. Oh, I, I don't understand, and why did this have to happen? But Job knew that the bottom line, that he still loved God, and there was still worship to God, and it was a sacrifice of worship. How powerful is that tonight? That we see a man that worships that's lost everything. I'm not saying this to you. I'm just saying this as a general statement. And then when folks come into church, they're too distracted by everything else. They're distracted by life. They're distracted by their cell phone. They're distracted by uh, what's for, for lunch. Uh, they come in and they'll say, well, I'm tired. I'm wore out. Uh, I, you know, it's not an excuse not to worship. God requires sacrificial worship. If you knew the week that I had, if you knew what was going on, if you knew my loss, if you knew my situation. And, 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 and sometimes we, you know, we have to be careful. We don't want to slap people in the face when they're down. But the, 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 the meat of the matter is tonight is that we learn that we need to worship God right now when things are good or if it's even just mundane, as Brother Craig said, we learn to worship God so that when it is difficult that we know how to offer the sacrifice of worship to God. That is real worship. That is real worship. Let me read this next uh, paragraph. We can feel overwhelmed, we can feel tired, we can feel depressed. Let me just say here, uh, uh, there is nothing wrong if you feel depressed. Do I think you need to live there? No. But sometimes in life, it can be overwhelming. It can be uh, 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 very difficult. I, 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 you know... Really, for me, I think, even in my life, after the loss of my brother, there was just a weight. I mean, for me, do I feel like... Uh, I, I, let, let me be cautious of my verbiage here. It was overwhelming, physically, emotionally. Spiritually, I trusted God, but I just... It was, it was a struggle for me. But we have to worship. And I can tell you, I did worship. And it broke free. So if you feel like you're, you're in the molly gross, I, and I'm not saying I was clinically diagnosed with depression or something like that. I'm just simply saying it was a dark night of the soul for me. It was difficult days. But God brings us through. All the way through, I knew that God was going to help me. But it was a process of getting through until there was a real just free. I've said this over and over again. The two best friends on our side when we go through difficult times 
Number one is God and time. We have to give ourselves time to get through the process. It is a maturing period. It is a growth period. It is a time that God is doing something in that season. And as we go through that season, and don't rush the season, don't get stuck. But allow God to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not that, that, that you're going to die, but it's that, that place that, that is tough and difficult. David wasn't going to die there. He didn't feel like he was going to die. He was just saying, in that difficult valley, you walk. And so here it is, whether we're overwhelmed, tired, depressed, heartbroken, poor, poor uh, broke, abused, all those can uh, uh, be, be linked to one another. But the sacrifice of worship goes beyond that we feel, that we feel. and makes us say, this is what is happening in my life. This is how I feel. But I still love you, God. I still want to serve you. I still worship you. You are faithful. You are still God. You are in control. You are in control. And I love you. Let me just say this for a moment. How many of you have ever gone through something that um, has been emotionally hard, uh, spiritually hard, physically hard? And we trust God and God brings us through it. But those are moments in our life where maybe it brings a big life change. Maybe that's a pivotal point in your life where there's a life change. And so, uh, because it's been difficult, there can be good ones too. But, but I'm talking about sometimes the bad ones. And then maybe you hear someone reflecting or there's uh, something that, I'm just going to call it this, I'm not going to go into lots of descriptions. There's something that's a trigger that takes you back there for a moment. And maybe it pushes that emotional button of where you've been. Uh, because of your past. That happens, that's normal. And, uh, uh, you, you know, but once again, even when we go through those triggers, what do we do? We worship God because He's prosper. When we're going through the difficult times, we know that life may change and it may be difficult, but we trust God with the future and we know it's going to be okay when it comes out the wash. What did Job say? He worshiped in such a way, he says, even if God slays me, yet I'm going to trust in him. Even if the worst comes and I die, I'm still going to trust in him. I've told you this all very, uh, probably frequently, but uh, one of the most amazing things to me is I see uh, Brother Schumper, is he was just um, uh, uh, deteriorating rapidly. And uh, in his body, he looked at it, he saw it deteriorate. He couldn't even uh, uh, communicate verbally anymore with me. But when I read the scripture with him, how that he just raised his hands there in his hospital bed, and he worshiped God. That is amazing. That is a sacrifice of worship. Amen. When people are dying or when people are going through difficult times, that they yet worship God. Someone uh, read Isaiah 57, <clears throat> verse number 15 through 19. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also 
and restore comfort and contentment that he was mourners. Mm -hmm. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will be with him. Oh, oh, praise God. What a promise. What a promise. Someone read Philippians 3.10. Hopefully, you let me, let, me, uh, let me read that sentence there. Worshiping isn't all about worshiping God when we feel, when we feel like it, or only when everything is going right. So I want to read Philippians 3, verse number 10. That we may know him in the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, and he may conformable unto his death. Amen. The fellowship of his sufferings. We forget, amen, that uh, there is a fellowship with Christ in the sufferings. David Wilkerson said in a message, A true worshiper is one who has learned to trust God in the storm. This person's worship isn't just in his words, but in the way of his life. His soul is at rest at all times because his trust in God, God's faithfulness is unshakable. He isn't afraid of the future because he is no longer afraid to die. Amen. I'm going to stop right there, Brother Doug. I'm going to let you just, you can, you can practice what you're going to say for next week. Because we're going to get to Paul South this next week. But Brother Doug had a really good thought on this. Amen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take his, his thought. I'm going to let him share it. But, but I want to stop here to give us time. I'm going to share a story with you. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to share with me. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'm a little bit transparent because uh, it, it's helpful for me uh, to share my experience in, in, in the work of God. It, it helps us uh, because uh, we know what God's done for us. <coughs> well, let me tell you about a story of someone who, uh, and I told this many, many years ago, uh, of someone who just displayed true worship uh, to me in such a way that I appreciate it. When I was in Bible school, I had some teachers, um, their name was Ralph and Rebecca Heath, and they're just wonderful people. If you ever meet them, they're just very gentle, very uh, very uh, soft-spoken, very kind, very building up, um, just talented people. And uh, uh, Sister Heath uh, played the guitar, and she sang a lot. In, in Bible school, she sang uh, the song, Whatever It Takes. And whatever it takes to grow closer to you, Lord, uh, this is... Uh, what I'll be willing to do. I'll take comfort for pain. Some, uh, 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 some, or if it's sunshine or rain, the, the words are getting really confused in my mind. But whatever it takes, that's what I'll be willing to do. When I was in Bible school, it hadn't been long ago that Brother Street had come back from the mission field. They had been in Sierra Leone, West Africa. They didn't come home by choice, but they came home because of just the, the, uh, the riots and uh, uh, the, the seriousness of uh, their lives being in jeopardy. And Sister Heath was asked to sing the song, Whatever It Takes. And uh, it took a little while to process this. I understand it even better now as I'm older. But uh, she shared her testimony of how it had been many years since she had sung the song. She said not because she didn't love God, not because she didn't worship God, but she said she sung the song because she'd been asked to. It had been something that she had done for many, many years uh, without really knowing what she was saying when she was singing. She had given birth to uh, a little boy there in the, uh, Africa, Sierra Leone, West Africa. And when the little boy was doing fine, they had taken him back to uh, be circumcised, what they did not know was that he had a bleeding sore, possibly using hemophilia. And so it stopped his blood from being able to clot. And after he had that procedure done, they took him home. The doctor said that the bleeding will stop, it'll be okay, but the bleeding didn't stop. And they became very concerned. And so uh, her husband left their home with the baby in arms. And he went to the medical facility where they were. However, the facility was compounded and it was closed. He had no way of getting a hold of any medical people. And so they stood and they held that baby in their arms. So he took his last 
had they been here in America, they would have never went through what they went through there in Syria. And that night, when Sister Heath sang that song, it had been many years. She said, I'm now able to sing the song to me. I heard that song hundreds and hundreds of times. But that night, I heard it from a sacrificial worship. Because she knew where she had been. And she knew, and she knew what God had done in her life. She was willing to a sacrifice on worship, saying whatever it takes to go closer to you. That's what I'll be willing to do. How about you tonight? Can you share stories of what you've seen of sacrificial worship in your life? Maybe what God's done for you. Can someone share tonight? I feel the presence of the Lord so very real tonight. And then I want to encourage us. This is a place where we can be vulnerable. This is a place where we can share. Uh, because uh, there's safety. 